there are many, many, many add-on modules for Foundry Virtual Tabletop. If you're just getting started, it can be difficult to figure out what you need to install first. Stick around and I'll show you which ones you should start with. What's up gamers, I'm Josh and this is Copper Dragon Games. On this channel, I share tips and tricks for dungeon masters who are trying to improve their games. If you're always reflecting on your practice and trying to improve your game as you entertain your friends, make sure you click that subscribe button below so you can join the conversation and never miss any future updates. Today we're talking about Foundry Virtual Tabletop, my personal favorite virtual tabletop, and specifically the add-ons that you need most when you first get started on the program. These are essential. When I first started on YouTube, I recorded a very similar video in which I shared my top five must-have add-ons. It's still my top performing video, even though some of what I said in that video is outdated and no longer useful. So now that the Foundry Virtual Tabletop software has been upgraded and I've gotten a little bit better at this YouTube thing, I wanted to share today an updated version of that video where I go back to those add-ons. Some of them don't work anymore or aren't useful. Some of them are just as awesome as they were before, if not better, and I've got a few more to add to the list. So let's jump right in. All right, so as we kick this thing off, I want to point out that the background art that you see here in the scene was actually uh, created using some of Gabriel Pickard's art assets. I put them together into a cool background scene using GIMP. You can click the link in the card above to see both how I did that and also how to find his art online so you can purchase some for yourself. We're going to use this scene with three adventures gathered around a fire to showcase the different add-ons that we'll cover in this video. But we'll start with just a little bit of housekeeping. One of the first add-ons that I covered in the previous video was one called Deselection. And that module is actually defunct now. It is not useful anymore because that functionality is built into the core programming. You may find it frustrating if you're first starting to use Foundry that when you click on something, it seems like it would make sense to just click somewhere else to deselect it. However, that is unfortunately not the case by default. By default, you have to press the escape key to deselect it, or click on another item to change the selection to the other thing. It's not enough to ruin the experience, I don't think, but it is a little frustrating and it's not exactly intuitive. We used to need an add-on to fix that, but now we can go into configure settings, which you can find up at the top right. Go to game settings and then configure settings. And here about halfway down, you find left click to release objects. Go ahead and click on that and save your changes. And now we can click anywhere and it'll release the selection of whatever we had clicked on previously. So one thing in a game of Dungeons and Dragons that you probably want to do if you're DMing is be able to draw your player's attention to something specific on the map. In this scene, there may be some monster or NPC that managed to sneak up on the party, and they first reveal their location to the players by rustling some of the bushes nearby. Now I can look at this map and say, you notice the bushes nearby rustling. What do you do? Well, of course, the first thing the player is going to think is, Geez, there are tons of bushes on this map. Which ones? The ping add-on lets you very easily draw their attention to a specific point on the map by just clicking and holding down on that spot. So if, for example, the players are camped around this campfire, and the next thing that happens is that their easy rest is interrupted by unexplained noises coming from one of the nearby bushes, then I can clearly point out when I say nearby bushes, these nearby bushes and it's very clear where that sound is coming from. One of the things that my players and I use this most commonly for within the game is to differentiate between monsters whose tokens look very similar on the board. Which character is the monster attacking? This one. It's a very quick and easy module to use that you'll almost forget that you have turned on. If you ever disable it by accident you will very quickly realize that you are missing something essential for your game. If you're playing 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons on Foundry Virtual Tabletop, this next module is something you just absolutely have to have. This module speeds up combat significantly by letting you customize what appears on the chat log card whenever something's clicked on a character sheet. 
For example, when I click on a character sheet and go to roll for an attack, it takes one click to put it in the chat log, another click to attack, another click to choose advantage, normal, or disadvantage. Then I have to check to see if it hits or not. If it hits, then I need another click for damage, and then I have to specify whether it's a critical hit or not. That is five clicks for just one action. That may not seem like a lot, but over the course of a four hour session or whatever, those are a lot of extra clicks that you could be avoiding if you were just using better rolls for 5e. So I'm gonna turn that on real quickly and I'll show you the difference it makes. So once we get it turned on, we can go to configure settings and module settings, better rolls for 5e. We wanna make sure it's enabled. We wanna enable dual rolls. That means that every time you roll a d20 in the game, it's gonna go ahead and roll two dice for you. If you have advantage, you'll choose the higher of the two. If you have disadvantage, you'll choose the lower. And if you don't have either one, you just pick the first roll. And then you wanna scroll down and enable rolling critical damage dice. You can set it for a couple of homebrew rules as well, or optional rules as well. But the important thing is to make sure that you are rolling those critical damage dice. This automatically rolls the critical damage dice if you get a nat 20 on either one of your rolls. If you had disadvantage though, or if it happened to be on the second roll and you didn't have advantage or disadvantage, then you can just ignore those dice when they come up. Either way, once you've set up these settings, you can save your changes and rolling for an attack takes far fewer clicks. You can see I can just click on this attack one time and I get all the information that I need. I have two attack rolls. If I have advantage, I'm using the 21. If I have disadvantage, I'm using the 13. And if I don't have either one, I'm using whatever the first roll is. I also get my damage roll automatically. And if one of these had been a nat 20, it would automatically add a second set of damage with the crit dice added. So let's get a nat 20 and I'll show you what that looks like. Apparently I'm really bad at rolling them. There you go. Okay, so in this case we got a nat 20. We get 7 damage normally plus 7 damage from the crit roll. And so we're doing 14 damage total. If we had disadvantage on this attack and we were using this regular 20 not natural instead, and we did not actually have a critical hit, then we would just use that first number. Either way, just turning on these features reduced a five click process, oh, there's four, a five click process down to just a single click. There are also some other tools within the app to help you customize, for example, if you have Elven Accuracy, you can do the triple threat roll and, and roll three dice at once. But this is the main reason that we use Better Roll for 5e. Just to reduce the number of clicks it takes to go from clicking on your attack roll to finding out the results. Alright, so next up is Token Mold. This is a cool little app that, that lets you change how Foundry generates tokens when they're dragged over from the actor directory onto the scene itself. It is important to note once you download Token Mold that the settings for this add-on are not in the same place that you'll find most of your settings for add-ons. For this one you go over to your actors directory and Token Mold will be displayed up here on top and there's a little settings icon on the far right that lets you pull up all the different configuration options you can use with this particular add-on. This is one of those add-ons that I use sporadically. I always want to have it available to me, but it's not something that I use when I'm prepping for every single session. This is most useful when you're about to run a scene with lots of different tokens on it, and it helps you differentiate between different tokens that look very similar on the screen. It lets you do that in several different ways, and we'll break down how each one works. The first one is by modifying the name of each token. You can add counting numbers as a suffix so that each token that you place on the board just has a little parentheses behind it with a number. And as you continue placing them on the board, the number increases so that you can differentiate between goblin number one and goblin number 63 or however many you end up playing. You can also add random adjectives from the dictionary. 
I found that these don't always line up especially well with uh, with different monsters that I'm placing. Uh, we'll throw a couple examples on the board. Oh, first one. There we go. So the first thing I, I throw down is a floral goblin. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that's supposed to mean, but I'm sure you can get creative. Maybe this guy is one with some flowers in his hair, or maybe he has a Hawaiian t-shirt on with some, some big flower artwork. I don't, I don't know, but there's something about a floral goblin that just strikes me as silly for a typical Dungeons & Dragons game. You start adding these to the board and you will definitely get some adjectives. Uh, a panoramic goblin, that's interesting. Um, so this is one of those things, again, that I don't use very often, but if you're looking for inspiration, you want to do something a little silly, uh, this is, uh, it's definitely something that you can do. Now the system specific settings will change based on what system you have enabled, obviously. I have Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition enabled, so these are the options that I have right now. The first is to send the result to chat if I have hit points rolling. If you have this enabled and you uh, put a goblin on the board, for example, then when it re-rolls its hit, it's 2d6 hit points for that individual goblin. Ooh, there's a dangerous one. That's the first one I put down this time that didn't sound kind of silly for a D&D game. But hey, I guess technically as a CR 1 fourth monster, even dangerous might be a little silly. But either way, send result to chat just sends that 2d6 roll to the chat log. The next piece can be really important. Occasionally I'll put a, a giant on the board in, under default settings. And even though I have the stats set to it being a huge creature, it will still show up on a one by one square. Um, I'm not really sure why that happens or if it's just a, a weird thing that I've run into a couple times. Um, but this fixes it so that that never happens. And uh, I like to have that enabled so that when I drop a monster on the board, it comes out the right size. The default configuration settings uh, let you change lots of different attributes and display names and things. The only ones that I usually mess with are the scale multiplier and the mirroring effect. And both of these are very useful when you are placing a horde of monsters. So I'm actually going to change the name settings back off because getting a bunch of floral goblins is annoying to me. But we're going to add a bunch of goblins to the board and I'm going to change these effects so that they're more noticeable. And then just show you what you can do with this type of setting. If I'm about to add a horde of goblins to the board that are about to attack my party, I may not want all their tokens to look exactly the same. And you can use these two uh, settings to differentiate between them just a little bit so that it's not a horde of completely identical tokens, even though technically we're using all the same tokens. So let me uh, save this and close it. So I can start adding these goblins to the board. And you can see that they will come out now with different sizes, uh, different facings different rotations, and wow, that one's really little. Uh, but anyway, I exaggerated these a little bit. You really probably don't want 0.4 size modification to 1.5, which is, I think, what I put on there. But I, I did it just to exaggerate the effect and make it more obvious. But instead of having what you would normally would get with this, uh, adding six goblins to the board, which would be six exactly identical goblins facing the same direction. This is not a game-changing, amazing uh, modification, but it does add just a little bit to your hordes and your big groups of monsters or townsfolk or whatever it is you're adding to your game that you want to not look so uniform when you have lots of them side by side. Token Mold has tons of other options that I'm not going to go in depth on, but it is well worth downloading and checking out, and I definitely recommend it. Another Foundry add-on that I just can't do without is the dice tray. This is a quick little quality of life upgrade for Foundry that gives you some visual buttons to click on when you want to roll dice in the chat log. 
Normally when you want to roll dice in the chat log, you can type it in. Oops. Say 2d10 plus 2, whatever that ends up being, right? And you get your roll. But typing that in can be annoying, and not everything that you need to roll is going to come directly from your character sheet. If it comes from your character sheet, it's really easy to just click on that item and, and roll it straight from there. But if it doesn't, and you just need to roll a d10 or whatever, you can type it in, but the dice tray add-on adds buttons to the chat log interface so that instead of having to type it out, you can just click. So let's enable that, and I'll show you what I mean. Now we return to the main screen with the chat log interface, and you can see down in the corner, we now have all these buttons with the different dice types that are typically used for role-playing games. I can click on as many of these as I need to to have a complicated roll, add or subtract some numbers, and make the roll. As you're interacting with them, if you happen to click an extra time that you didn't mean to, you can right-click to remove a die. And if it's a d20 roll, you can actually specify whether it has advantage or disadvantage, and it calculates it for you automatically without you having to remember that KH stands for keep high, and if you want to have advantage, you have to add that manually. This is one of those apps that is not really a deal breaker for the game, but I'm actually kind of surprised that this isn't in the core Foundry experience, and I wouldn't be surprised if something similar was added in a future update. Next up, we have a small add-on called Default Scene. If you're creating a lot of maps and a lot of scenes for your game, especially if you're creating lots of variations on a similar theme, Default Scene can save you a ton of time. When you create a scene, let's create one just for kicks. We have lots of different configuration options and vision options that you can set for each scene that you create. One shortcoming of Foundry Virtual Tabletop is that there isn't a native way for you to save your configuration options as you create multiple scenes. You can do that by duplicating scenes, but then you might have to go through all the hassle of deleting all the elements on your scene before you start from scratch with a new one. Default Scene gives you the option of saving all your configuration settings so that they stay consistent as you're creating multiple scenes. If you get all the way to the bottom of the Configure Scene screen, Normally, this is just one big bar that says save changes, but with scene default, you get a save as default option, and then whatever settings that you've created for the scene that you just created will be the default for whatever scene you create in the future. If you're planning to run a bunch of one shots or like a monster of the week style campaign where every different session has a wildly different look and feel, then this isn't gonna do a whole lot for you because you're probably going to want to customize these every time. But if you're running a campaign that has a fairly consistent setting across multiple sessions and you are creating six or eight scenes, for example, that all take place in different variations of an Underdark setting or a Forest setting, this is the kind of app that will save you a surprising amount of time as you create those multiple scenes and keep all your configuration settings consistent across all those scenes rather than having to set them manually. The last add-on that we're gonna to cover today is one that has saved me a ton of time in my prep and one that I was unbelievably excited to see in the list of add-ons. And that is the Kobold Press OGL for Foundry. One of the hardest things about switching over from Roll20 to Foundry for me was not having access to the Creature Codex and Tome of Beasts, which I used extensively in my games, and I continued to use them even once I switched over to Foundry at first just by creating custom monsters either within the program or in D&D Beyond. But it took a lot of time to migrate that information over from Roll20 where I had purchased the products originally. When I first started using Foundry, I was actually more likely to use monsters from the SRD just because they were easier to pull up and all I had to do was find an image and they were ready to go. But I was so used to the variety and the surprises for my players that the Tome of Beasts and Creature Codex brought to the table that it was really sad for me to kind of put them to the side and use more SRD monsters just in the interest of prep time and, and managing my balance between game life and real life, the Kobold Press OGL add-on changed that entirely. It adds all of the Kobold Press monsters that fall under the OGL, 
uh, which is, I think, all of them. But anyway, it adds all of my favorites from the Tome of Beasts and from Creature Codex. And uh, I believe now it even includes uh, the Tome of Beasts 2, but I would have to double check. Uh, if it doesn't yet, I'm sure that it will soon. Adding the Kobold Press monsters to your game adds tons of value to the experience for a lot of reasons. Just like dice, monsters are something that DMs can never have enough of, and it's always good to have an extra set of challenges that you can throw at your players at a moment's notice. Technically, by adding this add-on, you're getting a bunch of free monsters. But don't worry, you're not actually stealing from Kobold Press. All of these are released under the OGL, so they are intentionally open for use. Kobold Press puts out amazing content, though, and one of the things that you don't get with this add-on is the artwork that goes with each of these creatures, and their art is amazing. I do want to encourage you to go pick up their products. Uh, I have, and I've definitely not been disappointed. In the video description, I'll include a link to my recommended products page on CopperDragonGames.com. Many of the links on that page are affiliate links, so if you follow them and make a purchase, I get a little kickback from that. As I said, many of them are affiliate links, but all of them are products that I have personally used in my games in the past or am currently using in my games now. So I know for sure that they are quality products that I can stand behind. Again, Kobold Press is an amazing producer of role-playing game content, and I encourage you to check them out. Whether it's through my affiliate links or not, their products are well worth the time and money. So there you have it, folks. The best Foundry Virtual Tabletop add-ons that you'll need when you first get started. If there are other add-ons that you know of that you would recommend for a new user of Foundry Virtual Tabletop, please share with me in the comments below so future viewers of this video can learn from your wisdom as well as mine. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked what you saw, learned something new, or just enjoyed hanging out, I want to remind you to click the subscribe and like links below. And also check out CopperDragonGames.com for more of my content. I'll be back soon to share more gaming tips and tricks. See you then. Thank you.